Hello, everyone. It's good to have you joining us again for another live story coming on Live Stories Worldwide. A wonderful stories from all over the world, stories of joy and happiness, stories also of abuse and struggles and pain, different types of stories. We share these stories on social media each Monday. And uh, if you want to know more about it, you can go to our website, lifestoriesworldwide.com. You'll find lots of information about this work. These stories can be viewed time and time again on, on YouTube. We encourage you to become a subscriber to our YouTube channel. It doesn't cost anything. It's a free subscription. Please join us. You can also find on our website uh, information like our app that you can download, a free app from Android or Apple, and also a free Bible app that you can use for your own private devotions. If you want any other information also, you can phone us on our hotline, plus 44-794-355-0287. Today, we have a story coming to you from Birmingham in the UK. We have Dr. Abide Zanenga, who is a uh, head teacher and co-founder of Riverside Education. He has been involved in education for people with special and children with special needs for 25 years in Zimbabwe and the UK. He also has a son, an autistic son, and I'm sure you'll share something about that today. So we do welcome all those who are watching, especially those in Ukraine and the people on Torch Trust who are listening. Thank you for being with us. So I hand over to you now, Abide, to share your story. Thank you. Alan has said, my name is Abide, as in um, Abide with me. Uh, and I will try and um, be as slow as I can so that you can uh, hear me. Um, and um, if you can't hear me or if you need any clarification, please, you can always uh, ask me the questions. But I'm here just to say, uh, and to appreciate uh, to appreciate uh, the opportunity I've been given by the panel and by God. I'm grateful to be here. I know I've learned through life uh, that, um, you know, we shouldn't take it each day uh, for granted. So I'm grateful I'm alive, I'm here, and I'm sharing this with you. Um, uh, so my story starts from here. Um, so this is me at the age of uh, eight, nine, possibly 10, my first day to go to school and my sister, uh, this was in Zimbabwe and this is here uh, on my PhD graduation with my two professors who did uh, help me quite a lot. So my story starts with, uh, um, uh, it starts from Zimbabwe where I was born um, and raised. Um, and that was my first day to go to school. Um, it just as an ordinary young man or an ordinary boy, I grew up looking after my father's cows in the, uh, in the bushes and the forests. And um, uh, you know, the normal, anyone coming who comes from Africa would know what normal life in the village looks like. So it was quite normal for me, but uh, I always had this in me that um, uh, I had very successful brothers who, when I say successful, it means doing really, really well in school um, and uh, looking forward to going to university and they were very well talked about. So they, they were quite an inspiration to me, but I've always prayed and um, that I wanted to be like my brothers. And I had this urge in me that uh, God just make me look like my brothers. And I led on to uh, David's story. And I was always saying, God, can I be like David? Can I be like David? And I remember the other day we were working in the fields and my mother said, um, what would you like to do when you grow up? Straight away, I never hesitated. I said, I wanted to be a doctor uh, and I meant a medical doctor. And from then on, if you go to my village, my second name is Doc. I'm always known as Doc, Abide Doc or Doc Abide before. Uh, this is at the age of 12, 13. And, um, but some people decided to change it to it was Doc, that's what my mom told everyone. And, um, but some people decided to change it to Doko. And uh, Doko became Doko Roro. That was from school. Doko Roro means uh, chicken manure. 
So that became even more popular. So, uh, and I was an athlete and I, I was, I was um, involved in 100 meters, 200 meters, and everyone wanted to go, doko, doko, roro, yeah, doko, roro. I, I didn't like it, but uh, it stuck. So the name Dokororo stuck more than Dok uh, because uh, it, that's what my rivals wanted in school and just to put me down. So I grew up with this label that, um, and it, uh, it, it made me feel that, okay, fine. Um, Dokororo chicken manure is nothing. So I grew up with uh, an age to prove people wrong, uh, to prove to be as good as my brothers. So that was always my prayer. Um, lucky enough, I was raised in church. And um, I, if I'm to mention a date that I was saved, I can't even remember because all I knew was going to church. That was it. And I was taught to pray, but um, not to believe. So I, I just would pray, but not know whether God would know it or not. So I went to secondary school. I was just an ordinary young person, uh, an average student. Uh, until after my A-levels, uh, because I want, I had now changed, I wanted to be a lawyer, but it didn't work. Um, in, there was only one university in Zimbabwe, by that time they were establishing a second one. So there were two at that point in time, two universities in Zimbabwe, um, and I couldn't get enough grades. Uh, you can imagine someone with a B, a C, and a D, three subject, B, C, D, couldn't get into a university. I couldn't. So uh, that was devastating. That was embarrassing. All the dreams gone. Uh, I remember uh, thinking about taking my own life due, just due to shame. That was very sad. And that was uh, my first, um, I had my first beer on the day of the results uh, because I wanted to numb the embarrassment. I wanted to take away the embarrassment. And I thought if I drank this bottle of beer. Uh, for those who come from Zimbabwe, they know it's called Bollingers. I would jump over the bridge and kill myself. That's what I wanted to do. Uh, so I finished that bottle, but nothing changed. I thought I would be drunk and I would not know what I would be doing and they would not know. I won't have any pain. Uh, that never happened. Um, looking back now, my main aim is to go to the university was I had had that I, you know, when you go to university, there's so much freedom. You know, you can have girls in your room and nobody would ask you. And at that point in time, that was my uh, teenage years trying to explore um, what things are like. But I know, uh, looking back now, um, that was when, if, you know, uh, at the height of um, the HIV pandemic, people dying. And what I didn't know was uh, how much the Lord was steering me away from all of that. So I got a place to go and train as a teacher. But I did put it in myself as well that I didn't want to be an ordinary teacher. So to cut the long story short, I focused on training as a special needs teacher. Mm -hmm. You hear the trumpet call He's coming Jesus is coming And when he comes We'll crown him Lord of all And when he comes We'll crown him Lord of all But I think this is where the journey started um, When the Lord started preparing me For what was to come as soon as I joined Special Needs, I just excelled as a teacher uh, and got some distinctions. And then the British Council came over um, uh, looking for people who had excelled in their areas. And I was one of them. They chose me, gave me a scholarship uh, to come over and study here. But um, let me just take you back to uh, the start of the Special Needs and the award of the scholarship. Uh, for me, that was a miracle. Um, from Norway, I just said I wanted to do special needs. 
And when I started doing special needs, I excelled like never before. Um, and people were just coming around me to support me, you know, uh, from cities, professionals, officials, just saying, you can do this from nowhere. And I want you to learn from this that uh, when God sets you up on a journey, he will provide the resources and he will set you up on that journey, not on your own, but he will provide the people as well. So at that point in time, God was beginning to plant people in me. Uh, people at the head office of education knew about me. I don't know how. And when I went to submit my application for a scholarship, I want to dwell on that um, uh, a little bit. Uh, it was at lunchtime and I decided that I am not going to post my application to go to the UK for a scholarship, but I am going to present it in person. I got there at lunchtime and I saw someone at the reception who I knew and he said, what are you doing here? And I said, um, I have brought in this um, application form. And he said, oh, you know, as much as it is still being advertised, but we've had enough applicants. Um, and I'm just here at the reception, but the receptionist has gone on lunch. So you're very lucky. If it was the reception, she could have taken it and put it in the bin. But you're very lucky. I'm going to take your application and put it together with the, one, with the other ones. So it's closed. I'll just throw it in. Um, looking back again, you know, sometimes you can only understand God when you look back. That I came in on this specific day at this specific time and met this specific person. If I had met any other person, if I had posted my application, that wouldn't have happened. Uh, so my application was processed um, and um, I was the only person out of the 35 people chosen in the whole country of 14 million people. I was chosen to be amongst the 35 people. I was the only one without a degree. Everybody else had a 1-1 one, one or a 2-1 degree. There was one person without a degree. And again, I want to share with you that uh, when the Lord opens the doors, nobody closes. And going back to this picture, when the Lord sets you on a path, nobody will take that path away from you. So here I am, go to the UK, uh, did my first degree, uh, and then went for my master's, got another scholarship to do my master's. When I was um, doing my master's, coincidentally, we were doing something called uh, various types of syndromes. Uh, you know, there's Tourette syndrome, there's Red syndrome, there's Prader-Willi syndrome, and there's Down syndrome. For some reason, I chose Down syndrome and Prader-Willi syndrome. Prader-Willi syndrome was something to do with someone who cannot stop eating. And I just found it funny because I was young and I said, surely someone cannot, uh, can tell that they are, they are full. How can someone not stop eating? And I wanted to explore that. That's when my son was born. Uh, and when someone is born with Down syndrome, one of the things I had learned in that week was, um, you know, these, these lines like that, uh, they always, a Down syndrome person is one line that runs across like that. That's how, how you first diagnose it. So my son was born. First thing I went for was to look at his palm, just for interest sake, because I read about it. And I saw the line and I thought, oh my God, what is this? Uh, you know, uh, I was young and I was told that uh, you only have a Down syndrome child when you're old. And the chances, uh, these statistics was like one in a million. Um, so I was, I wondered why, why me? So as I was trying to process and trying to understand whether I'd seen, um, the right thing. And by the way, that's my son, um, over there. My, my wife commented that, oh, he's got, um, you know, he's got some, some eyes that are funny, uh, funny eyes. And I, but then I didn't hear what she was saying. Anyway, I didn't listen to what she was saying. The doctor came in and they took us aside, um, uh, and say that, do you know anything about uh, Down syndrome? I could, I could hardly hear her, but I think she mentioned about, do you know anything about Down syndrome? Um, and I said, yeah, that's what I'm studying. And then she said, uh, your son has it. Uh, I remember 
uh, that day, it was the 30th of December, uh, 2005, it was snowing. And I walked two miles back to my flat where that I was sharing with my wife. My wife had had a cesarean. She was in hospital. I forgot to, the, to catch a bus and just walked. I had so many questions in my head that, uh, you know, thank you, Lord, for all the blessings you brought me over here. I haven't got a family here, but look what you've done to me. This is after um, it's something that I hadn't mentioned. This is after we, we had lost a daughter in Zimbabwe. My, my wife had given birth to a daughter, baby girl, and we had lost her because the doctor was drunk on duty. Uh, she was born prematurely and put in, a, in an incubator. But then the doctor fell asleep and um, we lost the baby. And the counseling was um, that we received that was uh, the devil attacks every family. And this is your attack. So do not worry, you're going to have another baby and all, everything will be fine. You're young, you'll have a, another baby. Take this as your attack. So I took it on the chin. I said, the Lord will give me another. And I was questioning, so is this the other one that you've given me? Can I not just have a break? I'm here, I'm not working, I'm studying, it's cold, I'm on my own, I'm lonely. And instead of celebrating the birth of my child, I am mourning the birth of my child. And every time I have to call a friend or people in Zimbabwe back home, I have to say, we have had a baby, yay! He's got Down syndrome, ah. So that was the reaction throughout. Um, so it wasn't easy. Uh, lucky enough, I had, um, again, as I said, when the Lord takes you on a path, there are always people uh, around. I had friends from all over the world that I was studying with, um, from Cyprus, from Spain. They came around, they helped. My lecturers were very good. They offered me to take some time off, which I didn't take. And I got a lot of support um, uh, to go through. Uh, for those who do not know about immigration, if you're a student and if you're a foreigner, if you're in this country, your passport is written no recourse to public funds. So we couldn't, we couldn't claim anything to help us with the baby. We had to work for it. Um, so we decided to work for it. Uh, and then uh, um, after two or three years, we had another baby. And again, um things came about uh is the baby okay you know i had lost confidence everyone was just asking is he not the same as the other one is he not the same as the other one um but the lord is good um he was fine But at that point in time, my first child, the gift, uh, his name in English is the gift. His name is Cooper. Cooper means gift. Uh, stopped talking. And he went mute. And he started rocking and flipping like this. Again, this is something I had learned um, at uni, that that's autism. So I'm thinking it can be Down syndrome and autism. Usually that's rare. Um, so I took him to a pediatrician. Guess what? The pediatrician, Dr. Robertson, had, uh, go, had been to Zimbabwe for a while, just uh, as a backpacker, and she knew a lot about Zimbabwe. So we clicked quite a lot. Uh, and I showed her the videos of my son and I said, um, I think he's got, he's got um, autism. And she said, yes. So she diagnosed him with autism. At this point, I'm thinking, when is this going to end, Lord? So I've, I've got a child now with Down syndrome and autism. I'm on my own in this country. And um, I have to find a way to survive. Uh, I got a job, permanent job. Um, so we started living with my wife. Um, and then I took it upon myself um, to go around talking about uh, my son and helping other parents like myself, which I thought uh, would help others. So in the process of doing that, uh, I decided to set up a school for parents like myself 
uh, for all that I'd gone through and to try and help them. And because that's what I felt the Lord was telling me. But then how do I know that it was coming from God? How do I know the Lord was telling me that? Number one, he put people, a lot of people around me who were praying for me for no reason, just praying for me and coming to me saying, you need to write a book about this. You need to start your own school about this. That is what I was getting. You need to write your own book about this. You need to start a school about this. For five years, I resisted it. Then I met a man uh, um, who had retired as a head teacher. He told me there was a building to start a school. I went over to see the building. I couldn't afford it. Uh, and I met um, uh, a friend from school who came along and he said he's got a lot of money. He could help me. But you know, sometimes the Lord puts people in your life for a reason and for a season. This friend only came in for six months, gave me a bit of money to deposit on that building and he disappeared. Never heard from him again. Tried to contact him, couldn't get him. So now I'm stuck with a building which I can't pay rent for. So I went to the landlord and I said, I told him my story and I said, um, I can't afford the rent and uh, this is my story. So possibly the school not gone. This landlord, this landlord is a gentleman who was born over here, raised here, proper Englishman. I don't know him. He was just a landlord to me. He looked at me and he said, you know your story, you seem genuine. And I don't know what's in me, but I am going to write a check. And he wrote a check of a lot of money. And when I say a lot of money, it was a lot of money. Uh, he guaranteed half a million and he said, right, I've worked hard all my life. I want that half a million back. When you start your school and when it's doing well, you have to pay me back. But if you don't pay me back, it's not going to affect me because I have savings. In fact, I'm rich actually. So it won't affect me if you don't pay me. But if you pay me, it still won't affect me because I have money already. But I want it to affect and have a positive impact on you and the parents you are claiming to want to have a positive impact on. This gentleman is not even a Christian. And I will go back to when the Lord sets you on a path, he will open the doors on that path, whatever barrier it is. And remember, the little boy, has just been guaranteed half a million to save lives and to, um, to help other parents. And it began to dawn on me, I had voices in me, and these are not mental health voices. These are voices of doubt saying someone like me would never do this. Who will believe someone from Africa to come over here in England? and say, I want to help people here. It should be the other way. The people from England should go to Africa and help them. So why, why would you think you can help anyone here? Someone like you can't. And I come from a family that has never had a business. So someone can, like me, I, I haven't got a business uh, acumen or a business born in me. So I began after, after the, the guarantee of a half a million, I had a lot of doubt whether that, as much as I'd worked out for it, I didn't want it. But the prayers around me, the people around me that God had supplied, who I never told, they kept on praying. I had about three pastors praying for me from different churches, uh, different denominations, people praying me. And remember, this gentleman who is guaranteed half a million is not a Christian. but he can be used by God to do God's work. So I went over to the local authorities, to the professionals that I knew, and we opened the school in September, 2015, uh, on the 15th of September, 2015, and one kid walked through the doors. And I remember 
a huge sense of relief and a huge sense of doubt. We wanted 30 young people walking in and one walked in. Again, we continued to pray and within um, three, four months, the school was full. Praise the Lord for that. And I began to work through and paying my, um, my guarantor the money back. But I want to dwell on the guarantor just a little bit. That I do not know possibly, I do not know how many people are listening and I do not know what they believe in. But I, co I couldn't understand that a stranger from another country who is not related to me would guarantee me that money. Why wouldn't he give it to his nephews, to his brothers and sisters, to his family? Why me? I don't know this guy. He doesn't know me. Um, that's when I began to have more and more confidence in how God was using me and how God was supplying um, the, the, the resources for me. And I, wa I want to share with you that... Uh, when it's coming from God, it's effortless. You will still have some barriers. As, as, the, as the word says, no weapons formed against us shall prosper. I, want you to do, I, want, I just want you to listen on that. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. It doesn't mean that the weapon is not going to be formed. There will be weapons against us as, uh, as Christians. There will be barriers formed against us but because of the protection we have around and because of the hedge of the protection of the blood of Jesus they will not prosper he's coming Jesus is coming I can't wait to hear the trumpet call he's coming Jesus is coming And when he comes we'll crown him Lord of